Good morning, Palantards. Starting out Saturday morning here, having some coffee. Wanted to recap what was quite an eventful week. Um, <clears throat> man, uh, <laughs> where to begin? So, uh, Chris Patel uh, dropped some bombs last night on the Palant Palantir Weekly, announcing he had exited his position in Palantir. That was interesting. Uh, I encourage you all to check that out. Um, there's this, uh, video that Jay just put out about also, um, Sasha selling his, his position. Encourage you to check that out. There's some cool info from Jay. Uh, also this week, you know, uh, there's been quite a lot of chatter about, um, Alex Karp as the CEO of Palantir and how have people lost confidence in him? Um, I know that Tom Nash has been highly critical of the executive team this week. I know that Chris Patel has been super critical of CARP this week in particular. And I kind of want to spend a little bit of time, have some coffee, kind of break down my thoughts on that. Kind of talk about um, where my head's at as far as the product goes um, and, and maybe my plans to um, continue to build value on Foundry and what I'm thinking about building and where my project's going next. Um, but to get into kind of the leadership and strategy questions, like I don't question Alex Karp's leadership. Like I think he's a phenomenal CEO. There's no way to have to run Palantir without him. So like this idea that they're going to remove Karp in my opinion, um, or would, would even, that that would even uh, be beneficial on some level. I don't think that's right. Um, I do think that there's some, something to be said for breaking off the commercial from the government business. And that has to do more with my experience of dealing with um, the differences between a solutions business where you're customizing product for um, a particular client and you're doing like basically um, consulting and versus, you know, actual software product, scalable software platform, basically. And, and I think those concerns, you know, they run into each other. There are very different concerns when you're trying to run those businesses. There are very different um, growth and, and sort of revenue models of, of how you're going to scale and ramp those companies. Um, and also just that the, the government business has a direct negative impact on their commercial business in the form of negative PR, negative perception. Even if it's not reality, the perception becomes the reality. And so I think that uh, to a large degree, those two, two things are kind of conflicting. And how they solve it, I mean, maybe they can find a more elegant way to solve that problem than to separate the businesses. But that's an option. It could work. Um, you know, I think that in the long run, they'll, they're going to have to come up with some kind of solution there and figure out a way in which they can scale these two businesses and, and sort of um, make them, put them on their own growth plans and maybe find a way to have them not under a single strategy umbrella and let them have independent strategies, independent go-to-market strategies, independent scaling, the whole deal. So I, I, I really think Alex Karp is underappreciated to a large degree. I, I th what he's accomplished is like it's freaking phenomenal um and i think that the government side of the business is the most important mission for palantir um i think that they need to find a way to um, make ramp and scale their commercial to the for for like its fullest potential while at the same time delivering on that government mission so i don't question his leadership i do question the strategy i think it's wrong at least on the commercial side and i think they need to find a way to um you know, cultivate that commercial side with maybe, you know, maybe Sean wants to run the commercial division for Palantir. And maybe they find a way to make that work similar to how Andy Jassy um, made it work for AWS. You need someone like Sean. Uh, he's got an amazing vision for what Foundry could be. And I 100% agree with that vision. But there's got to be another way to get it there. Um, and, and I still think that their biggest problems they're facing are the fact this is a closed platform. That's extremely expensive, right? So like, I can't, developers aren't going to pay a million dollars to access a platform. They expect it for free. Um, they expect it to be open and accessible. And I think that that's just fundamentally going to be different resources, different engineering teams, um, you know, different sales strategy, all, a lot of, a lot of differences, you know? Um, so maybe that <clears throat> could actually work for them. Maybe, maybe Sean's the right guy to take over commercial and to spin that thing up as a the next AWS, as he's often called it, which I totally agree with, man. Like, I don't want to build software on top of another platform. I want to build it on Foundry. I think that's the right way for us to, as engineers to build agnostic software solutions built directly on top of the big data OS. We're spending an awful lot of time and money right now trying to build cloud agnostic architectures on top of 
the data warehouse. This is we're going a roundabout way of getting that data back into the system through these really complicated architectures when Foundry could probably make that super easy. Um, so yeah, I think that they've got to they've got to figure this strategy out, and and they're in my mind they're leaving a lot of a lot of potential growth on the table, leaving a lot of potential developers out. You know, like when I say growth, I mean they're leaving a lot of potential engine like growth of their developer community and growth of their adoption of their platform on the table. Because if I look at platforms like Databricks, for example, over the last year, seventy five thousand people were certified in Databricks. That's a lot of developers, man, who invested in that platform, got certified in it, or using it. What, you know, what's the number for for Palantir? And the, and the call they quoted ten thousand, but I seriously question the validity of that number. Um, I think that I would have to see exactly how that number was calculated to make sure there were no duplicate accounts, that they weren't overcounting an account like uh, the same user who has multiple accounts in different environments. Like, how are you actually coming up with that number, and does it make sense? Um, and and you actually, it can't be. Um, something arbitrary like unique user account IDs that actually you have to verify it to a human being, right? So I think that um, they've got a long way to go to, you know, ramp and meet their competition and their competition is taking those people off the table. Can they use both platforms? Sure they can. Can they get certified in both? Sure they can. Assuming they could access Foundry, <laughs> right? So um, that's the issue. That's why I'm saying they're being taken off the table. And what sucks is that those developers are then going to go build value on top of that platform, lots of value. And we're seeing that happen right away, right now with the, the Databricks marketplace and the Snowflake uh, marketplace. So in my opinion, they're leaving a lot of growth of the community on the table for their competition to go out there and snag. And it's going to be hard to get those people to move over. And so the longer you wait on this, the bigger the problem becomes. And, and you know, I don't know if we'll ever get to that, that thriving developer community we want to see if they don't course correct pretty quick. And so that that's where I question the strategy a lot as well. So it's it's the price point, it's the fact that it, this doesn't appear to be a massive issue for them, or they'd have a bigger team on it. They maybe give that team a lot more resources than currently has, and they'd be figuring out a way to get this platform in the hands of developers for free today, not a year from now, or two years from now, or three years from now, or what it's going to be. So I, I, that's where my head is at, and I just want to see this product be successful because I believe in it. Um, and I, I want to build value on it. I want to actually have people that can access it so I can build solutions on the platform that people can take advantage of. And I'd love to see a thriving open source community where we're collaborating on fun things you can do in Foundry to kind of educate the world on it and, and how you can use data to solve real world problems. So that's that's where my head's at with all of this. Um, can't really talk about my, my personal position. Um, I don't want to talk about the stock or, or projections on price or any of that stuff. I can't. Uh, and again, full disclosure, I have access to a free foundry stack. Uh, so full, full disclosure there. But what, what I'm, I'm just right in the same position I've always been questioning the strategy and wondering when they're going to make a change. I, I don't think that they're going to um, be able to capture the developer market and to get enough engineers on the platform to make that community as big and as thriving as it could be if they don't act soon. So yeah, that's where my head's out on that. Um, I really enjoyed the Palantir Weekly last night with Patel. That was awesome. Execute Order 66 was, was pretty epic. Uh, so I encourage you all to check that out. Uh, this video Tom did was pretty, pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I think Tom and I see eye to eye on, on the same concerns, you know, like, or, or at least in, he sees the concerns more through a financial point of view and I see them through more like the developer ecosystem and the scaling of that ecosystem so that we can build value on Foundry. And I think if you combine those two things, you get a really good perspective of where a couple people who are looking at the platform from different angles might be, or looking at Palantir from different angles might be legitimately concerned. Um, so that was a cool video. I would, I would check that out. Um, also, on Stack Overflow, guys, if you're interested, there's some really good info out there, but I did find uh, this one. And so I'm on Stack Overflow as well. So if you want to check me out on there, you can. I, I don't do much on Stack Overflow, but I did post a couple of um, Foundry questions based on my own internal usage. I'm working on some uh, geographic information system in Foundry right now to show how you can combine uh, Edge data, so uh, or like geo location data, uh, geo targeting data that's supplied at Edge by Cloudflare and AWS, and I'm just going to show how you can incorporate that along with your web traffic into a geographic information system. So I had some good answer. I had a good answer on uh, one way to do that in Foundry. You can check that out. But this is really cool too. How to test transforms in Foundry? What I found out is um, you can actually build a a sort of 
common way in which you provide synthesized data to your unit tests in Foundry. And um, you kind of get this like sort of generic uh, way in which you could write user, t user tests for each of your transforms that uses this tool called Synthesizer in Python uh, to generate just sort of synthetic data that looks a lot like the real data. And by doing that, you can build these really cool unit tests that um, can actually test out your pipeline in a really stable way so you know before the pipeline runs against the production data, is it going to actually work when it count encounters edge cases in your data? You can test joins as well to make sure that you don't wind up with like just crazy exploded joins. And so that, that's a really good way to provide stability to your pipeline and also to make sure that it doesn't take five hours to find <laughs> something broken, right? You, these unit tests run extremely fast in seconds, and so you can um, see the results immediately, and that provides an additional layer of stability. That's another thing people, um, I think, are overlooking as developers with, with Foundry. Ben, uh, over at Seattle Data Guy, he released a video um, this week. Let me see if I can find him down here. Where was he? Here it is. So Ben released this video this week where he was test driving Foundry. It was a bit light in content, in my opinion. It was still a good video. Um, it's really cool to see another engineer's impression of the platform. I'm, I'm really psyched to see like future videos. I do feel that um, what a lot of people are sort of missing is the the way that Foundry provides this huge layer of stability, both in the change management side by having that integrated Git, which Ben didn't really touch on in the video. Like the, I'd like to see some more info from him on the, the integrated CICD and what his thoughts are on that. But through both through change management and through the ability to unit test where other platforms you typically, you get quality checks, but you're running them against either test data sets or you're running them against um, production data sets. And that is a bit problematic from my point of view. You don't get the same level of stability that you get with unit testing in Foundry. So I'd be interested to, to see um, Ben's perspective on on like what do you think of the unit testing? Does it actually provide better stability? Because if it does, that's a key driver in the successful outcome of any of these projects. Like a stable pipeline delivers value, an unstable one is just a nightmare and costs money. So um, really cool stuff there, and I encourage you to check out the Stack Overflow article. I'll link it in the description. And then um, I'm also working on a demo of this as well. So in my next update video, hopefully you will see a demo of this as I'm doing the geographic information system with the geo with the location data. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, upcoming today, <laughs> Christian's doing a video uh, with with Chris at like noon, and uh, this is gonna be interesting. Uh, I can't wait to check it out. I hope you guys all have a chance to to take a look at it. But this is gonna be fun. And Chris, dude, you are a brave individual. He's got to be getting some serious hate out there. Um, you know, like, I think it's kind of crazy, but, um, you know, just be, I guess everyone just trying to be cool and, you know, it's, you do what you do. It's, it's a personal decision and, um, but I'm, I'm psyched and this is like actually super entertaining on a Saturday morning, have some coffee, sit down and watch, uh, watch what, watch what unfolds in this live broadcast and Christian, uh, cheers to you too for putting this together. And what's coming? Uh, upcoming. So news from Palantir that I can share with you. You all know about um, Pipeline Builder, and that is something I think is really cool. I think they needed a better visual tool for building pipelines. And what that does, what, what that unlocks, um, is the ability for like a product or marketing person to answer questions that aren't in their current data sets, right? So like if I'm visualizing something, maybe there's, there's something I'm missing, like this geolocation data. Maybe it's not in an ontology object yet. So what I want to do is be able to go out there, go to, directly to the source data in my data mesh, and then build a pipeline that's going to produce an ontology object, and then I can analyze it and incorporate it into all my analysis without having to go back to a data engineer to get that incorporated. That's a really powerful tool. I think it's going to really extend a lot of use cases for uh, Foundry, and that was really smart of them to, to build that in there. And I've also heard that it integrates with Contour, so you can like promote a Contour project into a pipeline builder project and then um, have the pipeline managed through that. So that's actually a really cool integration that I learned about. If you didn't hear, they're also doing a natural language processing solution um, to build pipelines from um, just human readable language, right? So that has some massive applications in my opinion because a lot of engineering teams, that could actually make the process of integrating new first party data uh, into the data mesh much easier. Uh, you could just produce a sidecar file along with your app that describes the pipeline you want created. And then also, um, there's a like huge potential in natural language processing, which is really cool. So, um, if for search, like if you're a sales rep and you want to find some, um, you know, data that's in the mesh, 
you're not a SQL programmer, but you can write an English sentence that describes the data you want to get, that can really help you close uh, cold calls and, and, and calls where you're trying to get a customer on board and you can actually pull the data you need to convince that customer. And I have worked on a project like that in the past and it was very successful. So I think there's massive application for that NLP stuff that they're working on. Uh, there are conferences in the works. I can't share with you direct dates, but just heads up, they, they you know, uh, Palantir, I think, finished, wrapped one conference that they are working on another one. Um, I don't know how open they are yet. I, I do know that they're maybe testing a few things out and see how things are working, but conferences are going on. So if you happen to see one in your area, be, be sure to check it out. And if I get dates I can share on, on any conferences that are coming up, I'll, I'll share them on the channel. Another thing I'm working on is... Um, Foundry certification explained. So this is the thing that's been in the works at Palantir for a while. They have a really mature certification platform. Uh, I know that they're working on a big overhaul of it as well. It's a great platform from what I can tell so far. What's cool is a lot of the information is public. So like a lot of the training materials provided in the um, each like, you know, part of the course are already public. And so I've, I've reached out to them and I've asked if I can publish a curriculum that includes all of, you know, because they have a really detailed curriculum, how to break all the stuff out and the um, phasing of how you read it all. And so I've asked to see if I can create a public version with all the public material and that can actually be like a certificate, like a prep for the, the course, right? So like you could go to my GitHub repo, check it all out, read through all the materials and be in a really good position to get certified as soon as that um, program becomes publicly accessible, which I hope it does one day. I'm not saying it will. Uh, but if it does, you'd be in a really good position to get certified very quickly, provided you go through that. So that's another thing that's in the works that I'm working on. And as far as anything else I can share publicly, I don't, I think that's it. Um, so yeah, just hang in there, people. Um, watch the sparks fly <laughs> later today with Christian. I can't wait to see that. And uh, be sure to uh, check in on the channel. I've got lots of stuff going on this week. Um, and I'm really, I'm really anxious to show this geographic information system and how you can combine this type of information with your web analytics streams. And to really show like how you can build a robust platform and foundry to do all of the traditional product analytics that we've done through really expensive, uh, hard to integrate platforms in the past and how that can maybe unlock your product teams especially if you combine something like Pipeline Builder in there, really unlock them to do some um, really powerful data analytics without being bottlenecked in engineering. So stay tuned, people. We'll see you next time.